Okay, hooray, people have returned. Because the thing is, if you do a talk in two parts, there is always this, to actually, does anyone actually return for part two? So that's a plus. Thank you. Um, so compilation and C++ and then the, the miscellaneous, but that's again more time management on my behalf. Um, good, so compilation, and that carries on on the same team what we talked about with memory and references, so we're going to continue with that. Um, so compile time in general doesn't have any impact on runtime execution, right? So it doesn't really matter how long the blueprint compiles in reality. It's just for you in the editor, it's annoying if it's going to compile for five minutes. That's the thing. It's a workflow thing. It's not an execution thing. Um, and usually, if you have long compile times, it tends to be a symptom of also having done the casting and the referencing suboptimal, and that in turn means you're probably having a, you know, a bigger memory consumption than you should have had. So again, in my game, I, I was learning blueprints, right? I started from the single documentation page of how to make a door. It's the first time we used it. The system was new, made some mistakes. It takes me two to three minutes between hitting play and actually being in a game. It's not ideal. Um, compile times in general are affected by three things. The number of blueprint nodes present. Kind of speaks for itself. Uh, any costing and other kind of references, because it's going to cost the other ones to compile too. So it gets uh, it quickly expands, and circular references could be also. I think it's been getting a lot better since a year or two ago with uh, circular reference in the engine. Anyway, you can actually enable the compiling and see that in the in the log file and such. Doesn't help you, but you could. Doesn't give you any actual use, but just to to make you understand, it's uh, there's a config setting. I think in game or in engine ini somewhere it says show show blueprint compile, I forgot what it's called, but you can find it if you're really interested in seeing that. But again, it doesn't really have any practical use. Now, blueprint has, I believe, that's why the asterisk is there, I'll get back to that in a second, has a 16-bit compiler limit, which results in a maximum of 64 kilobytes for a compiled blueprint. That was true two or three years ago. I've been trying to find the answer internally if that is still true. I tried to make a giant test blueprint to try to break it intentionally, I couldn't. So I'm not 100% sure if the limit is still that. But it doesn't really matter either. Whatever the limit is, it answers two questions. Yes, there is a limit to blueprints. There is a real limit. When you would hit the limit, what would happen is that the compiler would no longer work simply. It would simply fail saying exceeds 64 kilobytes or something. Okay? Then you can remove some things or, or redesign it and you'll be fine. And question uh, answer B that it gives us is it doesn't really matter though. Because if you hit the limit, there's probably something seriously wrong somewhere. And it's not the limit. Okay? It's probably something you've done. Um, in any normal kind of circumstances, it's not possible to hit this limit. That's the conclusion. Um, so they tried to build a few of these test cases, right? I tried to see, okay, can I replicate what might happen in, in different scenarios? I built this one massive blueprint, which I don't want to open, because it would take 52 seconds to open it, because it compiles on open or something, I believe, for the first, and you do it for the first time. Um, but you can see here, it has compiled in an amazing 51,000 milliseconds. Cool. And what I did here is I did a random set of notes, and then I copy-pasted them like 1,000 times, and I connected everything together. Okay. So the number of notes is the conclusion. It's really having a big impact on compile times. If you use macros, it doesn't really do anything. The macros are going to be inserted on compile into the graph itself. So whatever you put in a macro will simply be like copy-pasted into it, in a way. So it doesn't do much at all. Every now and then it might speed up a bit or so. It's not going to do it so consistently. It's not reliable. Functions, however, is going to make a huge difference. So you want to rely on use of functions. In my extreme case, and this is a best case scenario test, went from um, 52 seconds to 1.3 seconds using functions. A little bit faster. Same setup, but I moved everything to functions. In fact, I can show you where, what this one is. And it's ugly. Please don't, please don't complain. But for the sake of testing, I did that one. This is the reduced version, because the other one got too annoying to work with. So there's a lot of copy-pasting. That's the same function. And within the function, we have this random set of things. Okay? That's what I began with, to try to see how does that impact compile times. Uh, but again, this is the best case scenario, because the blueprint doesn't do anything more than that. There is nothing more to compile than that function, in a way. So it's very fast, so best case scenario. But still, the functions will really speed it up. And if ever you would hit the blueprint limit, the functions would work around that. Uh, they would reduce the compile size as well. So, so I prefer functions over macros. For, that's one of the reasons. 
Uh, obviously, and this is some of the more complicated answers, splitting off the functionality into different uh, blueprint actors, you know, child classes, child actors, components, anything like that. Moving into C++, all of that is going to have the same effect, right? But that's a much more complicated story. When should you move it? How much should you move it? It's so case to case dependent. Uh, but let's go back to the costing because it impacts both the compiling and the memory and the references, right? Um, when you cost, if you have a cost to the second actor, the second blueprint, when you compile this one, this one will compile along unless it hasn't changed. It does cache the results, but if you have changed both of them, compiling this compiles that, so you get a chain reaction. Right, for example, you get something like that, right? You got an interactive item again, that references the door, the door references an alarm, the alarm references the button, I think that still makes sense. There's a cost or some kind of link between them. Then the button references the player, which references the hut and everything else and everything, and it goes back and forth. So compiling that compiles this, and also loads it. Um, for example, this ridiculous example here, there's a blueprint with nothing more than this. This is the blueprint, okay? Cost two. The class, this was my slow, small size. It was my, my test for a very heavy blueprint. There is an, a variable here that holds nothing. This is empty and it's called new var zero, and the cost fails and it does print string. This makes no sense, okay? That takes 30 seconds to compile, simply because of that thing right there. So it doesn't even matter if the cost is successful or not. The fact that it's there is all you need. Um, anything that's a reference in general does this, by the way. I'm usually going to say costing, but what I really mean, costing in the wide sense of the word, any form of referencing between blueprints, because it's all the same effect. For example, let's say you take this, again, empty variable, but let's assume it's not empty. You get the class of it, and you just want to know if this is of a particular class. That thing here, 30 seconds. Same thing. And as mentioned before the break, so what you want to do is you want to kind of organize how you cost. When is costing good? When is costing not good? Like get a system to it. Put some uh, some thought into it. Don't just do it. A um, couple of examples. And again, my examples. You can argue yes, but I have this exception here or there, right? But it, just to paint the picture. Uh, imagine you got something like this. You got a lot of specific blueprints, and they can cost and reference the player. That would typically be okay on the grounds of that the player is probably in memory already anyway. I mean, it's the player, right? So there's enough. It's not going to give a memory overhead. It might give a slight performance uh, compile increase, but that's typically fine. Um, if you cost or reference one blueprint to another specific blueprint in a small isolated case, for example, button, door, it's a small isolated group, it's fine. Okay? They're probably present in the world at the same time anyway. The compile time is not going to increase much. That's fine. Um, if you have a blueprint that doesn't contain anything but variables, that would be fine to cost and reference because that's not going to add much in memory or compile times anyway. There's nothing in there, just variables. So that's probably okay. Um, but to go from, for example, a central class, like say the player, to something specific like traffic spawner or something, that would be a problem because this traffic spawner is always present when a player is present now. So don't do that. It's probably unless your game always has a traffic spawner, but it's assuming it does not. Um, if you go back and forth between the central classes, so player controller, player, all the, the, circle, the reference that goes back and forth, um, from a memory point of view, it makes no difference, probably. It does increase the compiles a bit, but probably this is okay, but there is a limit to it, right? Because the limit would quickly be this. You could have a traffic spawner reference in the new player. I just said that that's okay, but then the player referencing references everything else, so you still compile the whole thing. In general, you could simplify it like this. Situation-dependent functionality that's occasionally present can reference core functionality that's always present, but not the other way around. That's the general conclusion. Continuing on that, you want to have a system in place. You want to think this through. Again, I didn't do this for my game. That results in the three minutes before I can play my game now. Um, you want to minimize the chain reactions. You want to you want to be in control of this. So there's a number of things. We're just going to start moving more and more to C++ now, a number of tricks you can do. There's a couple of solutions that you can do for minimizing, minimizing all of that. Um, you can use C++ to bridge classes. This is one thing that I did a lot in my game. It's a very simple thing you can do. And a lot of these examples, by the way, are, they're C++, but they're very doable if you're not a programmer. I think that everyone should be at least on, on the skill level of being able to do these kind of things in code. 
because they're really easy, but they do help you along in Blueprint. Um, which one was it? It was 06. Uh, so for example, I've got, I forgot which one of the two it is. This is my particular class, right? So it says here, my vehicle, that is the C++ class called my vehicle. Let's imagine there's a lot of stuff in my vehicle. Uh, one of the things that's in the C++ of this my vehicle is, let's say, an integer that checks how many passengers there are in your car. I don't know, right? In fact, that's this one here. It's an integer, but it's set up in a different kind of way, because it's set up in a way that if I go to any other blueprint, let's say the level blueprint, I can say, and this doesn't work for every setup, of course, but this is assuming there's only one vehicle, okay? So let's roll along with that assumption for a moment. Uh, I can say, get the number of passengers. And this immediately reads that one there. It's bridged to C++. I'm gonna show you, because the code is not here, I'm going to show you the code of how that was set up in a few later slides in the C++ section. But that's one thing that I do a lot, because now I don't have to do, you know, get, get a reference to the vehicle, cost to the vehicle, or maybe, you know, whatever, and then from the cost I can retrieve the, the variable. That's the cost. I can simply, it also cleans up Blueprint and it speeds everything up. In any Blueprint, I can just do passengers. Cool, I got passengers. Health player. Cool, I got the health player. Score. I got the score. So all of those core variables, we made them universally accessible. And it's a really small piece of code, so it's, 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 relative, it, it's doable. So there's one thing you can do there. Prevents casting. Uh, you can do the same with, um, with functions. You can see the code there as well. And what you can do, this was 07. Same thing again there, I think. I believe that that is my vehicle. Uh, so there's an event here, event on passenger added. So essentially what I want to do is I just want to trigger this. This doesn't make any sense either, it's just an example. But I just want to trigger this from some other place in Blueprint. That normally would have been a cost, or at best an interface, which we'll get back to in a few slides. Um, but by having this event, the only thing in here, this event is in C++, all of this is Blueprint. The only thing we did is we brought this into C++. The event is there, I can go again in any other Blueprint, this is the level Blueprint, and I can say, what was it called? Passenger added. add passenger to main vehicle. I can call that. Calling that triggers this, I believe. So, let me double check there. Just make sure, yes, same one. So that's another way you can do it. And again, the C++ setup is relatively straightforward. This is doable to learn this and do this yourself, even if you're not on the C++ side. Um, when you cost, for example, Try to do this to a parent class. This works for Blueprint as well. So imagine you've got a game with absolutely no C++ in there, or it's not relevant for this particular example. Entirely with Blueprint, you can always cast to the parent, and you can do it in a way that it triggers specific functionality in the child, but you only reference the parent. So for example, that's what I've done over here. Um, let me remember what this is. So that's the parent. Let me close this first. Here's my parent. There's nothing, okay? It's completely empty. There's no functionality either. Now, this is a test, but even if this is real life, there would literally be no functionality in it. The only thing that would be in it would be the variables and the events. So you would literally make a custom event called, I don't know, Unreal Fest, and you leave it. And then you would make a child in the, in the child, it automatically gives you those same events. So now I can say, okay, give me Unreal Fest, uh, event on real fast. I got that event, and then I can say print string. Something simple, right? I can do that. Because it automatically takes the event from the parent. In the, wherever I cast to, for example, here's a casting example. It froze for a second. Come, okay, good. Um, you can see here, if I then want to trigger something, so ignore that, it's just an event. I cast to the parent example, which finds my event but I'm, I'm referencing, this would be the reference to the child. But the cost, or not necessarily to the child, but the, the reference is only to the parent while you're able to directly go to the child in functionality. So that's one way you can work around that. Okay, my explanation here was a little bit broken, but I think you got the picture, I hope, right? Um, that's what you did over there, because the child inherits that and then you can simply call on the parent, but the parent's event translates automatically into the child's event instead. Uh, you got interfaces. This is 09. Show this in the editor as well. All 
Right, so you can make it, uh, let me open all of them, this is an interface. You can make an interface and simply call it activate. There's no other functionality in here. The interfaces have been in the engine for a long time, even before the costing and other things were added. So this was the original way we had to communicate between blueprints. Let me try to find, uh, I think it was this one. This was the full example. Instead of calling on the actor directly, because here we have a simple example, if you press enter, we want to activate whatever the player is in front of. You don't know what you're in front of, so it could be a lot of different things. Here's kind of a very manual setup. This is the actor the player is looking at. Let's say there's a line trace that checks what you're looking at. And then it has to do a cost to an interface button, because maybe it's a button, or it does a cost to an interface door, and then activate that. This is going to reference all of them, because you're going to get a really long chain of that. Even if you have a couple of parent classes in there, you could do that. It's still not entirely optimal. So if you have an event that's really generic, like activate, because you could be activating a million different things in the world, make that an interface. This is the interface. It never references a particular class. It just takes the actor you're looking at, which is defined at runtime and could be anything. It's literally just actor. And it activates the interface on there. Even, and if the actor doesn't have the interface implemented, it'll just ignore it. So you don't even have to check it. Is this a valid thing to do? Is, does that, is that thing actually able to activate or not? It will just work by itself. If you have the interface made, because here we have activate, the only thing you have to do is on the On the actual blueprint, sorry, there, you have to implement, and I'm in the wrong ones. Come on. I think I'm in the wrong ones. Oh, sorry, I'm there. You have to implement the interface, so you add the interface there, and that's it. And in fact, by doing that, which brings us, I believe, to the next slide, because that's the one you saw, uh, you can also do a check, does implement interface. So instead of doing this get class example from before, you can do does implement interface. If it has the interface, then it means you can do X. So you can do a check. You can have a lot of different interfaces. And for example, this is the interface for breakable objects. This is the interface for, I don't know, um, well, what else can you do in the world? You can break things. What else can you do in the world? Um, <laughs> let's say it's glass. Fine, let's do like this. This is wood or so. This is glass. It's maybe not the best example. But you can then have these different interfaces and just do a check. Does it have the interface for glass? If yes, then we know it's a glass object and then we can do something with it, instead of having to do any other form of check to identify what we're looking at, which might be you know, a hard reference. You can use the tax system or the gameplay ability system with the gameplay tax that's related to it. We do this a lot in Fortnite. So in Fortnite, we add a lot of tax to everything in the world to, again, identify what are we dealing with without having to directly reference those things. So we can say, for example, this is player pick up a ball or so, and we've assigned that tag to all of them. So we can always do a check, is it a player pickup thing? We don't have to first get the class of it to identify, yes, this is the class that belongs to things you can pick up. We simply check the tags. So you can just specify the tags and then look them up in Blueprint. Actor has tag. We can get a tag array and go through that. Now, the best way forward though, is really the blend between it. So there's not one perfect solution here. Um, it's not that you should never use costing. It's not that you should do everything in C++. It's not that you should only use interfaces. It's all of them, where it makes sense and in a balanced way. So there's not an easy answer here, but be, be balanced with it. Think this through is the most important part is think this through. Don't just do it. Okay. A little bit on race conditions, but this is actually rather brief. Um, obviously, race conditions is when two or more classes depend on each other, but they could momentarily fail uh, because you don't necessarily know which one starts first. And especially in Blueprint, it's not very transparent. Uh, the whole reason when we came from Kismet to Blueprint, in Kismet you could draw lots of lines from the same thing. That was really difficult to figure out because of the race conditions, because you, you didn't know which line would act, be activated first. It was terrible. So when we went to Blueprint, we made it a rule that it's very linear. There's only one line coming from one thing going to the next thing. So you always know this is the order. You can't, if you add a sequence to it, for example, you know that it's going to be activated in sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It follows the order of the sequence. So you can follow it along. I had this basic little example here. I don't think I'm going to show you all the way. Uh, just to give you the overview, this is 11. Uh, what I did here is have two blueprints. I tried to hack it. Um, blueprint 1 needs Blueprint 2 to Blueprint 2 to use read one, uh, Blueprint 1. They're both dependent on each other. They're both checking each other. So one of them is going to fail the moment the game starts for a moment. Right? You can see that, for example, here, Blueprint 1 has failed once, false, and after that, they're working. So just to be aware of that, Again, think that through and plan it. Um, 
You can use is valid. Please use is valid a lot or the validated getter we had on the tips yesterday. Um, so just do an is valid on things to ensure that they do exist and they are present. Right, so just do is valid. That one, or that was actually for frame time. Let me do the other one. That one, for example. I use this one a lot just to make sure it is existing before you execute it, or it has been found, or etc. Okay, let's move to C. And I'm good on time. I think I'll be done about 15 minutes before the scheduled time, I'm guessing. So we'll have time for questions as well. Um, now, obviously, C++ and Blueprint are very closely linked together. I'm sure you figured it out. Because Blueprint relies on C++ for everything it does, right? Every node is basically C++. It's very easy to extend Blueprint with C++. Here's the, the, the basic code, all you need to make a function, all you need to make a variable. It's very straightforward. And again, I think if you are an artist or a designer, you should know at least enough C++ to do that. I mean, that's not much to ask. But it would help bridge the gap between you and the programs and the engineers. It would help to make you a little bit more self-reliant, even if it's on a very, very basic level. Um, and the amount, the recommended amount of C++ vs Blueprint really differs per project. I can't be here and tell you, well, it should be 80% C++, because that's not true. It really differs. Um, typically, and it's really ballpark figures, you could say about 80% if it's a large game project to 20% Blueprint, but again, it depends so much. Uh, if it's a non-game project, the balance could be 100% different. So as it makes sense, and a couple of considerations here. I think everyone in the team needs to start off learning Blueprint. So if you have new people onboarding and they're programmers, even if they've been working with C++ for years, if they're new to the Unreal Engine, I think they need to spend a week or so with Blueprint. Because it will help, it will help with a couple of things. It helps to close the gap with the other side of your team. Right? It helps to make those programmers understand the artists and designers more. What kind of world do they work in? Uh, how do they work? How does Blueprint work? It helps the programmers understand um, the unreal way of working more. What kind of classes do we have available? What's kind of the typical flow of, of how everything works in Unreal? Um, it helps them understand what do the artists and designers need, for example. You know, what, what would be very helpful for them? I have a few tips here as well in the next few slides. On the other hand, I think also that all the artists and designers should be able to do enough C++ to be able to do some of the simple C++ tips and tricks I have in here. That would help to bridge the gap the other way around. So we bring everyone a bit closer would be the preferred way forward. Uh, now, C++ is obviously more performant, obviously better for managing large and complex systems or math, right? I think there's certain things that are not, you can't do them in Blueprint or the suboptimal. So there's limits to Blueprint. You can do a lot, but eventually there's a few things where you get stuck. Safe games you could technically do in Blueprint, but again, I'm not sure if you want to, if it gets, becomes a, too complicated. There's a lot of platforms and device-specific stuff that should be C++. The control input menus, things like that, special hardware, SDKs, integrations. There's a lot of things, you know, the question is, can you ship a game on Blueprint? Yes, you could. But in my experience, it, you can go very far and you can make it work, but eventually the last two or so percent, you probably hit a very few very specific things you want to at least have C++ for that. But in any case, the balance between the two would be the best. Because Blueprint has some positives as well, some, some specific strength points. It's faster for creation and prototyping, right? I would say it's visual. You can involve more team members. That speeds things up too, makes it more creative. Um, it compiles faster, although now with a live, live uh, plugin for C++, that's improving there too. Um, Blueprint is much faster for iteration, because it's easy to tweak things, same reason. Uh, it's better for understanding and reading the flow, simply. Um, it's more flexible and accessible to the wider team, which is important. It involves the whole group, if you go that way. And memory-wise, it's much better because it's content, which leads to a conclusion we're going to get to in, over here. Um, because in large, this would be the correct setup. I mean, this would be the setup I would like to see in, in, in the majority of cases. There's always a C++ class. There's always a Blueprint class. So you simply make both of them right away. Unless it's a very specific isolated case, you always make both right away. And again, that's kind of where if the designer would be able to do enough C++ to make a class, that would be a plus, because that would speed it up. And then eventually the, the door is used in the world. You don't use a C++ class in the world, and you don't only have a Blueprint class. Because by doing this, you have the best of both worlds, right? The C++ class, which could even be empty the moment you do it. You could just make it in case of. 
but that could hold eventually, potentially or right away, the core functionality. It could hold the most important variables, because if you make a variable in Blueprint, that variable is not easy to get to from C++. That's a challenge. And later on, you're going to face a situation where there's someone made the health for the player in Blueprint, right? And you want to get that, to, you want to read that in code, which would make sense. And then you're going to have to take that out everywhere in all the Blueprints where they use health, and it's a mess. So all the important variables, just immediately just put them in C++ class. Uh, and again, they could be empty in the, in the future. That's what the bottom one says. The blueprint, on the other hand, could have minor functionality or visual tweaks out of visual effects and functionality. Anything like that. And again, I have examples coming. And any content references for the memory reasons, as mentioned before, would be best of and easiest to manage in the interactive door. Like, so you could literally have interactive door has almost all the functionality of opening the door, but the sound that gets played when the door gets opened, some particles, I don't know, metal sparks or whatever, those are in blueprints, all the content references in there, some specific functionality to trigger. When the door opens, please also do this. That's in blueprints. Now, typically, C++ would be any functionality that's used in more than one place, and preferably used in more than two places. I mean, you get the idea. Right. If you have an inventory system and it's used for your horse and the player itself, so you essentially have two different systems, probably that should be C++ because you want to have it work with both. That would be harder in blueprints. If it's used per tick, especially when it's many actors, C++ is better. If it's complex and uh, you know, bug prone, it's probably much better in C++. Uh, in my game, again, just to go back to the inventory example, I tried to do an inventory system in blueprint. It kind of worked. It was already obvious. It quickly got complicated. It got buggy. And it was likely to be extended significantly later. So we took the early decision to immediately move the whole inventory thing to C++. Yeah. Because it's just going to work better in the long run. Uh, anything that's really critical, safe games, networking, I would probably just do it in C++. You know, have complete control, have performance, make sure it works well. And again, important variables, enumerations, and all that should be, really be C++. But Blueprints should have pretty much all of the content references, again, case by case, exceptions, generally you could say. Anything that's straightforward and visual in nature should be in, C++, in Blueprint. There is no need to put that in C++ and exclude half the team from being able to access that. I think you should just leave that there. One of functionality, because there's not much gain to be had from moving that beyond making it less accessible to part of the team. Uh, stuff that's still prototype and rapidly iterated on, you could argue is better to keep that there, again, to involve a larger part of the team and make it easy to tweak that. And in general, don't move to C++ unless you prefer it, that's fine. But if there's no, no bias to either side, I would keep it in Blueprint. And there's no benefit from moving it, just I would personally keep it in Blueprint. So this is the one we had before, the passenger. So it's a pure function that reads the variable without needing, uh, needing casting. I think that's a simple little thing you can do. That's the code over there. Um, you can do function libraries, but you can also do them in C++. So instead of doing this blueprint function library thing, do, just do it in C++. Same effect, but it might be better. So that's that. Um, and I think really important towards the programmers, especially uh, for me as a designer, even if you do almost all the functionality on the code side, please just standardly give me delegates and events. Just give me things I could use if I would need to. Maybe I don't, but I have the option at any one point to open a blueprint and say, okay, what would happen if we take that event and then we do this and this and this? Would that make it better? I can do that. I have that freedom. Because it will invite the content team to actively participate. Uh, it makes future prototyping, tweaking, and polishing considerably easier. For example, I got this event over here. Let me just open that for real. This is 03. Um, ignore that. But it's this one, right? So imagine again, it's a vehicle. This is the vehicle. Um, and all the functionality for ho how the vehicle works is done on C. So there's almost no blueprint here. But it would be really helpful if the, whoever has made that vehicle class. It's just uh, it's going to give me a number of delegates. For example, give me an event on gear changed. And it might be empty, right? It might be just like this. 
Maybe this is all I get. But now I can always go to this blueprint and say, OK, I want a prototype that if you change the gear, something else happens. And I have it available. I don't have to go back to the programming team and ask them, can you please add this? Can you please do that? I want to try this. This is my reason and motivations for wanting to do that. I can just try it and see if it leads to something. And it doesn't take much effort, I would argue, for the programming team to just stand it, expose some of the things you do to blueprints so you can intercept that and try to do a few more things. For example, that was my little test setup here. You know, maybe you think, ah, oh, there should be a sound playing when you do that. And I need to have some visual UI widget coming up when you change the gear. And you have that freedom. Good. And I have a miscellaneous. Uh, wrap up section. A couple of random things. One thing that I always do in in Blueprint, if I disconnect something, I call a DOP. I just add comment DOP. So I'm trying to push this through as a standard by telling everyone. Okay. Uh, I started doing this all the way in the Kismet days. Uh, what it means is disconnected on purpose because sometimes, someone, you might see a node that is disconnected and then you're going to wonder accident, purpose, why? Did it break? Should I reconnect it? I'm scared of that. So I don't dare to do either of the two. So I always make sure it's marked DOP. I disconnected this. I did this on purpose. Just leave it be for whatever reason it was. Okay. Um, we have the pure functions. Very simple one. You can just do, um, if you make a, a function here, you can make it a pure function. And it, will just, uh, it won't have an execution pin. It's, just, uh, it's like a macro in a sense on, in terms of visual output, you know, where you see the, you know, like this, in terms of uh, underneath, what it does underneath, uh, under the hood. Uh, you can do expose on spawn. So there's a property in every blueprint that says expose on spawn. That when you then do a spawn actor, you get that property, expose on spawn, is present uh, within the act spawn actor interface. That's on a variable, I'm sorry. Let's just do that here too. Right, expose on spawn. So on any variable, if you enable that, it shows up in the spawn actor interface, you can modify there. Uh, you got call an editor. I have an example of that. You can see we have these buttons. You can actually make a button by just having an event call an editor. So I can now do this, and that will say hello here. I'm not sure why, but it will say hello there. You could do some actual proper use of this, so you could actually you know, calculate something or ex uh, print something, a certain result, or there's things you can do here. Or, for example, m you know, I don't think you can spawn something there, but you can probably move an object there, so snap it to something. I don't know. There's things you can do with that. And the way that's set up is you simply literally mark the, uh, the function or the event as a uh, call an editor. That's it. Um, this one is a little bit hacky. As far as I know, and I can't remember 100%, so, but as far as I'm aware, we're looking at changing this because it's a bit strange. If you have a sequencer, and it's, it's very hard to, it's very invisible that this is possible. If you've got a sequencer, first of all, you can do exposed to cinematics on a variable, I think. That will show, that up, show it up in there as well. But if you make an event that's called set and then the name of the variable you have, then when you have that variable in sequencer and the timeline runs, the event runs as sequencer runs. Okay. But it has to be specifically named like this. So in this case, I can do print string on that one that we're animating through sequencer. We're going to change this, I believe, as I mentioned, because it's a bit hidden, but it's a nice little trick. You can do delete unused variables. It's just in the menu. All right, so you can just do delete unused variables. Clean. What we do, by the way, as well, I don't think that's in the, the tips I might forget, but in Fortnite, for example, when we comment, in, you know, the DOP thing is mine, uh, but in Fortnite, we do um, a bug in there. So we would have, you know, bug ID. We actually mark, if we do a fix, we mark what fix that was for. So if this was the fix for that bug, we would have marked it. This is a fix for 8488, something like that, just to keep track of what changes have been made in the blueprints. So you know that if that in turn breaks or leads to further complications, this is what was changed in the blueprint. And it was tied to this particular problem. Uh, I got show 3D widgets. So if you have, oh sorry, let me do this over here. If you got a, a vector variable, you can say show 3D widget. By doing that, it will show up in the viewport. Because you can see that little diamond thingy there is my variable. So now I can change my variable by just dragging it like that. And 
show 3D widget. This is the variable. The value has now been changed without me typing it. I can just drag it, which is much more visual. I can just I use this a lot for if I have blueprints that place place things, place meshes or so, I can just drag the size of it instead of having to calculate it or do anything like that. Um, there's actually an option to deprecate stuff in Blueprint if you want to make sure that what you've done in Blueprint isn't going to be continued to be used. It's still there. You don't want to delete it because content relies on it. But you can mark it to ensure that people are not going to continue using that. Um, so I believe that is in the class settings or in one of here. I, and I've forgotten where it was. Hold on. I obviously don't seem. I don't do this too often. Probably class settings. Yeah, sorry. Class settings. Deprecate. It will keep the blueprint there, but it will mark it as this is outdated. Please don't touch this anymore. So at least that's been specified. OK. You got bookmarks in Blueprint, actually, since I think it was 419 or 420. Um, so you can now set bookmarks, and they will snap you to different views in here. Now, it's so new that I rarely do this, so I forgot how to do it. But there's an item in the menu that says bookmarks, right? It also shows you the comments. So the comments are now listed. So you can easily snap to one of your comment boxes. They're all automatically bookmarks. And you can also add a bookmark yourself, except I totally forgot how to actually do that. Because I never use that. Let's improvise. We have a bit of time. Oh, yeah, see? There's a star there. It's a button. Yeah, hooray. You can get some really good name here. And that shows up here. And then if you, you can go back there. Good. Sorry. Um, and as I think almost the end, we've got some string tables too, just to highlight that they exist. Um, I actually never used them properly. So when I was building this presentation, I went through all the different types and I realized, oh shit, that's actually pretty useful. So string tables and the next ones as well. Uh, a string table is, let me bring it up over here as well. I'm not sure where I have this here actually. Uh, I'll just go back to the slides to keep it easy. But a string, it's an asset in the folder, not in the in here. But a string table is its a table in a sense where you have the key and a source string. So essentially, again, you identify it, right? So the key is the identifier you want, and it's attached to a string. It's similar to the map that you've seen earlier. Here's a string, here's the asset. This is kind of the same, but the other way around for a string. It's useful for localization and those kind of things, where you can have an identifier. So you identify it as this is text for main menu one, or whatever, main menu button, this is your text internally, but externally it's tied to start, which you can then localize. Um, maps, similar-ish. Um, and I do have that in the project over here. You can see that's uh, a map. A map is, again, uh, a link between two things, so you can say, that asset is always linked to that other asset. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be particles and meshes. But you can say this variable, whatever it is, is linked to that variable. It's equal to. Um, so for example, you can always say, you know, if you pick that mesh, always pick the associated material. Always pick the associated sound or things like that. It ties the two together. So you need less logic and less management of, of that. Um, sets are somewhat similar. It's uh, kind of like an array, right? So here's a set example. It's an array. I mean, I can I add items to it, except it's slightly different because you can already see I can't add a fourth item to it. The way it's different from an array is that it has some embedded logic in it. Uh, you can only have an entry once. So I can't get that cube in here again, right? I can try that. See, I can't do that. So it's, if you would have an array and you would want to do a check, is what in the array is duplicates? You would have to do a reasonable amount of logic to check, OK, I've got this thing. Can I search my array? Does it exist yet? Yes, no. If no, then yes, please add it. If yes, please don't add it, right? I have to do all that logic. A set prevents that by giving you something that automatically checks if something is, is already in there or not. It only accepts unique entries. And as you can see, you can't keep adding things to it. The last one is empty, so it won't do it until you fill this up with something and so on. So again, I don't use these much, but they're actually very nice to use. And I believe it's valid, as we've done before, that we're now at the end. OK, good. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope you survived my two hours of hardcore Blueprint stuff. Mm -hmm.